Welcome to the Raisins Jesus podcast, 10 minutes every day where the life of Jesus meets yours. In this episode of the Raised with Jesus podcast, we have our sermon from this past Sunday, Pentecost 3, looking at Luke chapter 7, Jesus raises the widow's son at Nain. Here goes. Dear fellow redeemed, we consider briefly our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 7. When I was a kid, when I was a young child, we, we got home from school and, you know, did our homework, maybe played outside for a little bit. And then always around 4.30 or 5 o'clock when mom would start getting supper ready and we were starting to get a little bit restless, we would come in and about that time, the TV show would start running reruns of that show, MASH. And thankfully, thankfully as a youngster, most, most of the jokes went over my head. And I just, I just thought, well, you know, Alan Alda, he's pretty funny. And, and here they are over in Korea. It's this mobile army surgical hospital, MASH. But one of the episodes that, that, that really stuck out in my mind, aside from the episode where Corporal Klinger talks about using Tony Paco's hot dog casings, <laughs> the other episode that really stuck out in my mind is where where, corpor- or where Captain Pierce, um, Alan Alda, had been laboring intensely to save a young man's life in surgery. And he had been working so incredibly hard, and there may have been some personal connection. I forget the, the rest of the details, but the young man ended up departing this world, and Captain Pierce just went outside, walked out of the, the surgery room, and threw a fit. Understandably, he was very distraught. And Colonel Henry Blake came up and talked to him, and, and he talked him down a little bit, said, basically, take a deep breath. You see, rule number one about warfare is that young men die. And rule number two is that, that doctors can't change rule number one. And how true it is. That even though death is the most unnatural of occurrences that this world has ever seen, even though that is the case, it's almost like the background rule that just keeps reverberating. People pass away. Whether, whether old or young, whether, whether accident or heart condition or some other medical malady, people die. And rule number two, it seems, is that despite our best efforts, despite all of the medical advances that we might have made, we can't really change that fact. Sure, we can can prolong a life, we can extend a life. We've got kidney dialysis and chemotherapy and radiation and all these things. But we keep coming back to that one basic truth. That people die and we can't change it. And as a Christian, we understand where death comes from. We understand that if somebody dies, that proves that they are guilty of sin and that Jesus himself has been raised from the dead, breaking the power of death. But then we're still confronted with the facts that we cannot change and that people die. And the, even, though, even though Jesus obviously has the power over death, we still attend funerals and, and we still bury our loved ones. And so we've got our readings today that that really take us by the hand and give us a glimpse of God's power, asking the question, is God really trustworthy? Is God really trustworthy? Because at every step of the line, every step along the way, you as a Christian have devoted your life to Christ. You stood up here, whether at this altar or a different one, and you said, I promise that I intend faithfully to remain close to this Jesus, to follow him, to put up with ridicule, bullying, and even death, rather than give up my faith. We've made that promise based on the idea that Jesus is trustworthy. But no doubt, there has been at least one or two or half a dozen times in your own life where you've wondered, Can my God really be trusted? Because he's got the power over death, but does he care? Does he have the compassion to change things? 
consider. Consider this. Soon afterward, Jesus went on his way to a town called Nain, and his disciples with a large crowd were traveling with him. As he approached the town gate, there was a dead man being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and a considerable crowd was with her. This little town called Nain, among all the little towns of Judea, this is the only time that is mentioned in the entire, entire, entirety of Scripture. This little town called Nain that might not even have a stoplight, from the sounds of it. Where everybody knows your name, and it's not Cheers. Where everybody knows your name because it's such a small town. And word travels even more quickly, even more quickly than the high technology we have today of, of texting and the internet. They heard, oh, the young man is sick and, and everybody's bringing over casseroles and trying to help. And have you tried this? And what about CBD oil? I hear that helps. But the young man passes away anyway. Where is God with his power? And if God is powerful, where is he with his compassion? Because it sure looks like, here's this woman who's a widow. Her husband has died. She only has one child. And she has no means to support herself. And where is God? Is he really trustworthy? Because certainly he has the power over death. But can he have, does he have the compassion for this woman? Hasn't she suffered enough? A considerable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not cry. Okay, so he's got the compassion. <laughs> and that word there, compassion, in, in English, uh, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-I-O-N, the C-O-M part meaning with, and the passion part meaning suffering. So even our word, compassion, he suffers along with her. Maybe a different word, sympathy or empathy. He, uh, it's the same idea. Sympathy together with her, he is suffering. Empathy, he is in it with her, he is suffering with her. But language can't really communicate that heart wrenching feeling that is behind the word here. The word here that we have translated compassion is that, that feeling in the pit of your stomach when it's in knots and, and it's just wrenching you apart, it feels like. Um, it's a word this, that's splanknidzo or splankna. And it's kind of this, this visceral, very visceral word. This very visceral word where we would say, you know, Jesus' heart went out to her, and the Greeks write it down, or Luke writes it down as Jesus' guts went out to her. <laughs> Just because he is so in it. He understands her pain. He understands her pain, and he suffers along with her. He has compassion on her, sympathy, empathy. His heart goes out to her. And he says, don't cry. Well, we certainly have certainly have a compassionate God. When he says, don't cry, <laughs> his heart goes out to her, but does this God have any power? Because we need both. If our God is to be trustworthy, he has to both have the compassion and care, and he also has the power, has to have the power to change things, because, you know, you and I might care very deeply about something. You might care very deeply about um, the orangutans in Indonesia or the plastic in our oceans, but but you might not have the power to change, at least not in a substantive way. And you might have the power to do something, but you might not, might not have the care or the compassion to do something. Where you and I have the, the ability to provide for another. But then we first look at, at our own responsibilities and say, well, I've got to take care of this first. But is our Jesus, is our Jesus trustworthy? He has the compassion, and he says to her, do not cry. Take a deep breath, calm down. <laughs> Come on. She's at her second funeral of the two closest people that she's ever had in her whole entire life. And Jesus says, do not cry. And if he can't do anything about it, that would be the most callous and hard-hearted word ever spoken. His heart goes out to her. He pours out his heart to her and he says, do not cry. And then he says, he goes up to the coffin and touches it. The pallbearers stop. He says, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. Jesus touches the coffin. 
because the, the coffin is as something that is unclean because it's in contact with a dead body and dead things are all unclean in the Jewish faith. But rather than Jesus then becoming unclean, he who has power over death and life makes that dead thing clean by bringing him back to life. He demonstrates his power and he says, young man, I say to you, get up. And the young man sits up. <laughs> wow. Our Jesus is trustworthy because he has the compassion and he has the power to act on that. And that all makes sense, at least in a logical way, until you think of the fact that, well, uh, for instance, Pastor Hagen, you were just at a funeral last week, Saturday. And as far as I know, Jesus didn't, didn't come down and, and say, you know, Judy, I say to you, get up. And he didn't reassemble her ashes into a living, breathing, healthy human being again. Ash to ash, dust to dust, and we committed her to her resting place until the Lord returns. We shed a few tears, encouraged one another, and then we went home. And no doubt you've been there too. And wondering... At this point in my life, no matter what it may be, I see all these miracles in Scripture. And Jesus does those wonderful things over there, but what about my life? I've buried people. What about my life? I've got, I've got heart-wrenching pain. What about my life? I've got this, this, this swirling, whirling, wondering of why are these things happening to me? And the question, the only questions that keep bubbling up are the questions of that widow at Zarephath. What do you want with me, man of God? Have you come here to remind me of my guilt and to torture me further? And our trust is shaken. Because we see that Jesus has the power, we see that at least here he has the compassion, but where is the compassion for me? And where is the compassion for my circumstances? In my broken heart, is this Jesus that we worship really trustworthy? Is this Jesus that we worship going to follow through on his promises when I've stood up here and I've said that I would rather die than, than give up my faith in this Jesus? Is my trust placed in the right, right person? And especially when I know that at some point I'm going to collide into a wall that I cannot break through or climb over and this heart will stop beating and these lungs will stop pumping. And how do I know that this Jesus is really trustworthy in my life? I would say look at what he does again. Because the exact same Jesus we see here is the same Jesus that we worship today. The exact same Jesus whose heart goes out to this woman in this no-name little town that doesn't even have a stoplight. His heart goes out to her, but what does he do? He walks up. He has compassion and he speaks. And then he does something. That's his pattern throughout all of Scripture, even down to the present day. He leads with a word and follows with an action. He leads with a word and follows with an action. When he says, do not cry, he follows with the action, young man, I say to you, get up, and the man sits up. He leads with a word and follows with an action at every stage of his church's development, where he says, and uses the words that, that he has instituted. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He leads with the word and follows with an action by creating faith and bringing that baby into the forgiveness and the fellowship of the church. He leads with, an, with a word when he says to his disciples on Monday, Thursday evening, I am preparing a place for you. And he follows with an action by bringing them to that place at different, different ways and different times and different places. He leads with a word when he says, Take and eat, this is for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And he follows with the action of making himself present bodily with the bread and in blood with that wine. And he follows with another action by forgiving sins and reassuring Christians. 
he leads with a word when, when Pastor Hagen, with a you know, sometimes gravelly broken voice, <laughs> because I talk a lot, at least at church, he leads with a word when Pastor Hagen stands up and says, I forgive you your sins in the name of Jesus Christ. He follows with an action by actually forgiving your sins. And he leads with a word when he says, Dear friends, I am going there to prepare a place for you too. Dear friends, I am ruling over all of, all of history and all of creation for your good. And he follows with an action by doing exactly that. By preparing a place for you in heaven and by restraining the evil of this world and by encouraging us with his word. And that's even what we do as a church. We trust Jesus to continue leading with the word and following through with an action. He still speaks through his word today, through the Bible, Holy Scripture. And he still accomplishes things through that word today by changing hearts, by sending his spirit, by building up Christians in the forgiveness of sins. He leads with a word, even when, even when our elders go and knock on a door of a friend that they haven't seen in a while, or you or I do the same thing. And that, and that elder or that, that fellow Christian says, How are you? How have you been? And that's Jesus leading with a word and following with an action to bring that person back into the fold of his people. And sometimes even following with the action of disciplining that person so that they might experience a little bit of discomfort, at least here and now, but that they wouldn't be lost eternally because this Jesus, he leads with word and he follows with an action for the good of his people at every time, in every place. So the real question, is this Jesus trustworthy? If he is to be trustworthy, then he has to do two things. He has to be compassionate. And he has to be powerful. And he has to act by putting those two things together. And if you or I had ever wondered, and I'm sure we all have, if Jesus is truly trustworthy, then look here. Look there, look there, look there. In every place, he leads with a word, follows with an action. And so we hold on to his word today. We gather around his word and we use that word. Even though we don't see exactly what's coming around the next bend, we don't know what's going to happen in a year or two or five or ten, but we hold on to the word where Jesus says that his word works, that he is trustworthy, that he cares. And that one day, one blessed day, he will finally follow through with the very last action that he has promised to carry out which is returning and gathering his people to himself. And where the word that has preceded, the word that has gone before and built a fellowship of people who hold on to that word, that word will be fulfilled by following with an action of bringing his people to heaven forever. Where Jesus will have proven for all eternity that he is trustworthy because he cares, because he's powerful. He led with the word, falls with an action for you. Amen.